Welcome to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM Superstation, the future radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Monday, June 14th, 2021, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well today. Well, look, it's been a very, very busy day, and I'm uh, getting ready to head to uh, Atlanta in a few days for the ninth annual Juneteenth um parade and festival the three-day juneteenth parade and festival so i'm getting ready uh for that we had a very busy show on uh sunday and we talked about mega evers after we uh got finished here on 9 10 a.m the superstation we continued on our social media platforms and talked about mega evers we know june 12th uh was the anniversary of his assassination he was assassinated june 12th 1963 so we'll talk uh uh, some more about uh, Mega Everest later on in today's show. Uh, but with all the discussion going on dealing with critical race theory and new laws being passed in various Republican dominated states, states that have Republican uh, legislatures and Republican governors, um, you know, uh, on yesterday's show, we dealt with um, uh, critical race theory and we talked about uh, the Florida Board of Education. Uh, passing a rule, Florida State Board of Education passing a rule banning critical race theory being taught in classrooms, even though it's not being taught in classrooms, okay? So, you know, we talked about that on Sunday show, Sunday, June 13th. Well, um, Saturday, June 12th, Saturday, June 12th was a national day of action, okay? A national day of action. And thousands of teachers from across the country protested laws restricting lessons in racism on Saturday, June 12th, the National Day of Action. And teachers took a, uh, a, a pledge to teach the truth, okay? There have been numerous articles uh, written about this. Uh, there's a really good one from the Washington Post. Um, Washington Post also, uh, I saw from motherjones.com, Teachers across the country protest laws restricting uh, lessons on racism is the article from the Washington Post. This is a continuation on the attack on critical race theory, the attack on teaching about systemic racism in school, the attack on uh, teach uh, the attack on the 1619 project. This is coming from, quote unquote, conservatives. This is coming from Republicans who don't want the truth taught in schools. They don't want to deal with systemic racism. Many of them don't want to talk about slavery. You have a lot of them who say systemic racism doesn't exist. All types of nonsense like this. Most of them, when you ask them what is critical race theory, they can't tell you what critical race theory is. They just lump into uh, the term critical race theory, a bunch of things they don't like about racism. So we're, we're going to talk about the, um, the National uh, Day of Action that took place Saturday, uh, June 12th. You had thousands of teachers across the country who uh, were protesting. Uh, so we'll, we'll deal with that. And then uh, we'll talk some more about Megar Evers, okay? Civil rights activist Megar Evers, who oftentimes gets left out of the conversation dealing with the civil rights movement, okay? Uh, we talk about Dr. King, we talk about Malcolm X, Amelia Boynton, Septa McClark, Rosa Parks. Um, we we'll talk about Joanne Robinson, who was the president of the Women's Political Council in Montgomery, Alabama. And that was an organization organizing before the Montgomery bus boycott, uh, which started Monday morning, December 5th, 1955. You know, we'll talk about Jesse Jackson and Robert F. Williams and the Black Guard and uh, a, a host of uh, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer and uh, uh, you, you know, a, a host of different people, uh, and rightfully so, uh, but, you know, John Lewis, Ella Baker, et cetera, but oftentimes Mega Evers gets left out of the conversation, okay? And we know Mega Evers was assassinated June 12, 1963, uh, outside of his home by a white supremacist named Byron Della Beckwith. And Byron Della Beckwith was a uh, also a member of the White Citizens Council there in Mississippi. And Megger Evers was only 37 years old when he was assassinated. Martin Luther King and 
and Malcolm X were both 39 years old when they were assassinated. Megar Evers was only 37. All three of them left behind a wife and children. So we'll talk about uh, seven facts about Mega Evers that you should know as well. Seven facts about Mega Evers that you should know. And then we know Juneteenth is coming up. June 19th commemorates uh, Major General Gordon Granger delivering General Number Order 3 to uh, enslaved Africans there in uh, Galveston, Texas. So we'll talk a little bit about the history of uh, Juneteenth as well. And I'll be in Atlanta uh, at Centennial Olympic Park uh, Friday, uh, June 18th through Sunday, June 19th for the uh, June for the ninth annual uh, Juneteenth Parade and Music Festival. Arrested Development is performing this year. I think Angie Stone is performing as well. Visit JuneteenthATL.com, JuneteenthATL.com uh, for more information. I'll be there all three days. I'm speaking there Saturday and Sunday. Saturday uh, should be the same time both days. Saturday and Sunday, 3 p.m. to 4 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. both days in the amphitheater. We'll post all this information and give you updates at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. This is free and open to the public. It's a good family event. There are vendors, musical acts, double dutch team. There's all types of things going on at the Juneteenth Festival in Atlanta. Okay. Uh, it had to be. It has to be special for me to travel from Detroit down to Atlanta for, for 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 the festival. Okay, so I love Atlanta, but still, you know, there's a lot of a lot of work. Um, and and you know, and you know, if people found out yesterday, I'm you know, I'm paying my way there to Atlanta. They, they're not paying for me to <laughs> come down there, you know. But those are my people down there. Uh, Bob, uh, Bob Johnson, and Brad Lewis. All right. On the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you can control the circumference of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Now, we deal with a number of different topics here on the African History Network show. We deal with current, current events in history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. I so said, we're, we're going to have to do a special, we're going to have to do a special uh, show, probably with Kenya K. Stevens and some other, uh, some other women dealing with uh, relationships or something. We're going to do something for that. We, we probably can't do that on 910 because it's going to be too hot. It's going to be too hot for 19, okay? We're going to have to do that. You got to, I have to let y'all know when that's going to take place. It'll be on Facebook and YouTube. It's going to be too hot for, for 9, 10 a.m., okay? Uh, but it's, it's going to be lit, trust me, okay? Because if you if you go watch the last video I did with Kenya K. Stevens of the Juju Mama Love Academy, you know, um, it's, uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was hot. So check that, check that out. Um, Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 22828. And sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 22828. Then uh, also visit uh, our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, and through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. This helps us out tremendously. Uh, helps us keep broadcasting six days a week, keep doing the research, stay on the air, pay some of the bills. It'll help me get to and from Atlanta. All right. Uh, so we definitely appreciate uh, definitely appreciate the support. We just posted the link here. And as I've been saying the past couple of weeks now, um, the, and I got to let people know because I still get messages from people. Um, somebody set up uh, some fake uh, African History Network cash app accounts. That's not me. Okay. Uh, now we have it up here on the screen dollar sign the ahn show s-h-o-w is mine shows my name michael you see mine was set up in december 2019 before these fake ones popped up then it has my picture there these other ones are fake ones okay there's they've been stealing money from us i've already already reported them to uh, cash app so i'm trying to follow up with them and see what the next step is all right so let's jump into uh this information here i'm going to jump into the first topic um, we're going to go to clip one here, Shakit, in just a minute. So all the talk going on dealing with critical race theory 
the attacks on it, the attacks on the 1619 project. And then we see, uh, you know, uh, attacks on teaching about slavery and different things like this in schools. All right. And as, as I said, as we talked about on Sunday show uh, in Florida, Florida back uh, on uh, Thursday, June 10th, 2021, Florida, uh, the board, the state board of education passed a rule banning critical race theory in schools, even though critical race theory is not being taught in schools in Florida. OK, so there was a. Uh, what's called the National Day of Action, National Day of Action. I first saw something about this from uh, the Zen Education Project, okay? But teachers across the country protest laws restricting lessons on racism. Teachers across the country protest laws um, restricting lessons on racism. And if we look here at the uh, Zen Education Project, uh, project quickly, um, teachers pledged to, now thousands of teachers across the country participated in this. And I'm going to pull this up here on the screen share so people can see this here. Uh, a day of action, educators pledge to teach the truth. Educators pledge to teach the truth. Now, some of these idiotic uh, Republicans in state legislatures and their governors, you know, I hope some of their teachers are still alive. Grab them by the ear, take the rule out, spank them, something like that. That's some of them may like being spanked, but you know, take they take the rule out, spank them. You know, especially if they went to like a Catholic school, and tell them, uh, you know, how much of a disservice they're doing to children, but not wanting children to know the truth about history. So uh, across the country, a day of action. Educators pledge to teach the truth. This was June 12, twenty twenty one. Uh, lawmakers in at least 15 states are attempting to pass legislation that would require teachers to lie to students about the role of racism, sexism, heterosexism, and oppression throughout U.S. history. In response, educators across the United States are signing a pledge to teach the truth. In response, educators across the country are signing a pledge to teach the truth, to raise public awareness about the danger of these bills. We invite educators to make uh, that pledge public in gatherings nationwide on Saturday, June 12, 2021. This invitation, invitation is extended by the Zen Education Project, coordinated by Rethinking Schools and Teaching for Change and Black Lives Matter at School. This is a national call while bills and budget resolutions are being proposed, while bills and budget resolutions are being proposed and in some cases passed in specific states, the threat to teaching and the need for solidarity is everywhere. OK, so you can read more about this. Now, this took place Saturday, June 12th. OK, um, I want to go quickly to this clip here. Let's go to uh, let's go to clip one, Shakita. This is from uh, Baltimore CBS Channel 58, Milwaukee area teachers oppose GOP bills to restrict racial sexual discussions in class. Let's go to this clip. It's in the article. Across the nation and here in Wisconsin, teachers are organizing a national day of action to teach the truth. They want to continue teaching the full history of racism and sexism in schools. But say Republicans are trying to prevent that from happening. CBS 58's Rose Schmidt shows us how Milwaukee teachers are joining the movement. A year after we saw a historic social justice movement, several states are moving to define what race concepts can and can't be taught in schools. Wisconsin is considering doing so, but local teachers think that's a mistake. Today, we say no to bullying. No to censorship. As part of a national day of action, I pledge to teach the truth. Milwaukee teachers and school board members are standing against legislation they say would hurt their students. We are here today to defend the right to teachers to teach and students to learn the true history of our nation. History is what makes each and every one of us. It's a part of our, our identity. It's where we come from. At the state capitol, Republican lawmakers want to ban schools from teaching ideas linked to critical race theory. They introduced new proposals at a news conference last week. We need to teach students the basics to be proficient, not teach 
divisive concepts. Critical race theory is the decades-old idea that racism is inherently built into society. The bills don't directly mention the concept, but they prohibit teaching that one race or sex is superior to another. Our students want to talk about racial tensions that they see, racial discrimination that they experience. Francisca Meraz is an ESL teacher at South Division High School. Hey, hey pause it right she there, Shakita. About- pause it right there. Well, pause it right there. Uh, just back it up about 20, 30, about 30 seconds or so. We'll continue this another side of the break. This is the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the future radio on Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. All right, stand by. Stand by. Back from break in four minutes. How's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on your social media platform to invite your friends to tune in also. Stand by. Did anybody participate in the National Day of Action on Saturday, June 12th? Any teachers watching right now? Stand by. Anybody hear about the National Day of uh, Action before now, before I posted about it earlier today? And by back from breaking three minutes. All right, let's see here. Back from breaking two minutes. Okay, we got Becky, we have Jason, we got Walter. Who are the teach any teachers here watching now? Everybody share this broadcast and also click on the thumbs up. Click on the thumbs up. Click on the hearts, please, as well. So this will uh, uh, perform better with the algorithms on social media. Nine ten, the Superstation, Detroit's only African American talk radio. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the feature radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Monday, June 14th, 2021, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well. Calling numbers 313-778-7600 is the call-in number if you have a question or comment. 313-778-7600 is the call-in number if you have a question or comment. So right before the break, we were talking about the National Day of Action that took place across the country on Saturday, June 12, 2021. Thousands of teachers across the country participated in protests uh, against laws restricting lessons on racism, et cetera, that have been passing through various uh, Republican-dominated state legislatures, okay? And they took a pledge to teach the truth. They took a pledge to teach the truth. Uh, Zen Education Project uh, has uh, information dealing with this. This is where I first saw it. And then I saw an article from motherjones.com uh, about it as well. And I started doing research uh, on it for this uh, segment of the show. Um, a day of action, okay? Uh, this is at Zen Education Project, uh, dot org. A day, a day of action. Educators pledge to teach the truth. Educators pledge to teach the truth. Okay. Um, and right before the break, we were sharing a clip here from uh, CBS uh, Channel Fifty Eight in of uh, Milwaukee, because uh, some Milwaukee teachers participated uh, in this protest as well. Okay, let's go back to this clip, Shakita. Across 
the nation and here in Wisconsin, teachers are organizing a national day of action to teach the truth. They want to continue teaching the full history of racism and sexism in schools. But say Republicans are trying to prevent that from happening. CBS 58's Rose Schmidt shows us how Milwaukee teachers are joining the movement. A year after we saw a historic social justice movement, several states are moving to define what race concepts can and can't be taught in schools. Wisconsin is considering doing so, but local teachers think that's a mistake. Today, we say no to bullying, no to censorship. As part of a national day of action, I pledge to teach the truth. Milwaukee teachers and school board members are standing against legislation they say would hurt their students. We are here today to defend the right for teachers to teach and students to learn the true history of our nation. History is what makes each and every one of us. It's a part of our, our identity. It's where we come from. At the state capitol, Republican lawmakers want to ban schools from teaching ideas linked to critical race theory. They introduced new proposals at a news conference last week. We need to teach students the basics to be proficient, not teach divisive concepts. Critical race theory is the decades-old idea that racism is inherently built into society. The bills don't directly mention the concept, but they prohibit teaching that one race or sex is superior to another. Our students want to talk about racial tensions that they see, racial discrimination that they experience. Francis Tamara is an ESL teacher at South Division High School. She says teaching about race and sex is crucial in a district as diverse as Milwaukee Public Schools. If I were to say, no, I can't talk about that, then they don't trust me anymore. They'll feel like their experiences, their actual lived experiences don't matter, and I lose them. Under the proposals, schools and colleges that continue to teach these ideas could risk losing state funding. Parents could also sue their school boards. These bills give the parents the tools to hold their school boards accountable. Another bill would bar states and cities from training employees on critical race theory ideas. At least 16 other states are considering or passed similar bills. Reporting in the newsroom, Rose Schmidt, CBS 58 News. Okay. All right, pause right there. All right, thank you. Thank you. That's uh, CB8, uh, 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 CBS uh, Local 58 in Milwaukee. All right. So I, I want to look at this article here from um, Washington Post dealing with this um, National Day of um, Action. Okay. And I, I talked to people. Uh, a lot of people didn't know this was taking place. So I think it's a good idea, but I don't know who handles their marketing. Uh, they may want to give me a call or something. Uh, they, they need to do. I didn't see anything really about this on uh, MSNBC or anything like that, really. So uh, they, I think they need some help in the marketing department. But anyway. Uh, teachers across the country protest laws restricting lessons on racism. Okay. Uh, this is from June 12, 2021, by Valerie Strauss for Washington Post. For the Washington Post, the backlash is sparking a backlash of its own. On Saturday, thousands of educators and others gathered virtually and in person in more than 20 cities to make it clear that they would resist efforts in at least 15 Republican-led states to restrict what teachers can say in class about racism, sexism, and oppression in America. Now, organized by local educators across the country in association with several social, social justice organizations, the National Day of Action is meant to raise public awareness about the legislation and to send a message that they will not lie to students about the country's racist past and present, that they will not lie to students about the country's racist past and present. Now, several, several thousand teachers have signed a pledge that says, quote, we, under, we the undersigned educators refuse to lie to young people about U.S. history and current events, regardless of the law. We, the undersigned educators, refuse to lie to young people 
about U.S. history and current events, regardless of the law. And and see, this whole see this takes me back to the whole lost cause with the lie that was told that was taught by the Confederacy that the Civil War was about states' rights. And uh, it was this whole curriculum being pushed by uh, groups like the Daughters of the Confederacy, okay? The Daughters of the Confederacy. Um, and Vox.com, you know, uh, uh, Hannah Nicole Jones was on uh, MSNBC today, uh, the readout with Joanne Reed. And they actually played a clip from the document, from the uh, clip, uh, how Southern socialites rewrote Civil War history. Okay. Now I can see this stuff coming a mile away. I'm a historian. I know the game. Game recognizes game. You can't slick a can of oil. I know the hustle that they're running. And they prey on people who are ignorant of history. And, and, and many of these state lawmakers are ignorant of history, but they know a little bit more than the people they keep conning, including white people who they keep conning, who vote for them. All right. Uh, I'm going to send you this clip here, Shakita. Cue this up. We're, we're about to play this. OK. See, this. So you have to understand history to understand this game that they're running. So. When you look at the whole Civil War, OK, we saw a whole curriculum being pushed by the daughters of the Confederacy and people who were trying to write revisionist history and say that uh, the Civil War, the, the, the Confederacy uh, broke away from the Union because of states' rights. It wasn't because of slavery. No, it's because you wanted to write to own slaves. That's what it was. All we had to do was read your, sta your statements of secession. You forgot about that. Your statements of secession show that you talked about how slavery was central to your way of life, like statements of secession from Texas and Mississippi and different things like this. So they're going to have songs, they're going to have curriculums, they're going to have uh, nursery rhymes, all different types of things like this to indoctrinate the children with a lie. Now, ever since the May 2020 slaying of George Floyd, by police in Minneapolis, Minnesota, Derek Chauvin, who's in prison right now, wondering what, what happened to his life. This sparked a national social justice protest movement, and, and many public schools have attempted to introduce and expand lessons on the systemic racism that has existed since the nation's founding. But you got you have a lot of Republicans don't want you to talk about systemic racism because people like Lindsey Graham and uh, Governor Ron DeSantis, Governor of Florida, they say systemic racism doesn't exist. So when people say systemic racism doesn't exist, the next question you should ask them is please define for me what systemic racism is. That's the next question you should ask. Please define for me what systemic racism is. Now, this has sparked a backlash among conservatives, okay? The uh, the schools attempting to introduce and expand lessons on systemic racism that has existed since the nation's founding. And see, the reason why is, is because when you got a good thing going, you don't want people to take it away from you. So because you have a lot of people who benefit from white supremacy and racism and the maldistribution of wealth, power, resources, they're like, we don't want to give this up. We don't want you. We don't want the magician to show you how the magician does the magic trick. Because you, we don't want to expose the magician. We want to keep this thing going. So they don't want the they don't want the truth taught. They don't want the real history taught. They don't want to deal with analyzing how laws and policies have now distributed wealth, power, and resources into the hands of the dominant white society, and they don't want to deal with how laws and policies are used to oppress people. So they want to make you think that oh. Oppression doesn't exist. You just have to try harder. Like that, like the study from uh, uh, Gallup, I think it was Gallup or YouGov, April 4th, 2018, 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. King. 40% of white people surveyed said they believed the, white, uh, the African Americans could be as equally successful as white people if they, if they just tried harder. Okay. I guess they never heard of the Tulsa Race Massacre in 1921. 
all right, or African American farmers lost ninety two percent of their land, twelve million acres of land over the last hundred years, largely because of discrimination and racism coming from the federal government. Now, th this has sparked a backlash among conservatives. Republican led uh, state legislatures are or have already passed legislation whose wording is remarkably similar or identical, reflecting a coordinated effort with such restrictions. Now, talk about coordinated efforts. See, we go back to the video leaked to Mother Jones of Jessica Anderson, who is the executive director of uh, with a project Heritage, I think it is, Heritage Project, which is, a, which is an arm of the Heritage Foundation. And she's talking about the coordinated effort to write these voter restriction bills and now 380 something uh, uh, bills in 48 state legislatures. OK, these are voter restriction bills. And she talked about the campaign to pressure governors to sign the bill as soon as it passes the state legislature. And she talked about how they did that with um, uh, what's his damn last name, uh, uh, Brian Kemp. OK, Brian, uh, Brian, I stole an election from a black woman, Kemp, OK, who stole the stole election from uh, uh, Stacey Abrams and, and Brian Kemp, governor of Georgia, signed SB 202, the voter restriction bill in Georgia. He signed the bill within an hour of it passing the state legislature. and He didn't even read the bill. Remember, he signed the bill. He has six other white men in the room, the seven dwarfs behind them was a, a, a famous painting of the, the, Call the Callaway Plantation in Georgia and outside an African-American uh, female uh, state legislature, Park Cannon, was being arrested by, by white uh, uh, state police. And she's knocking on the door trying to get in to do her job to witness the signing of the bill because that's part of her duty as a, uh, as a member of the state legislature to witness the signing of bills. So on Thursday, June 10th, 2021, Florida's State Board of Edu uh, Education, or we could call it the Board of Miseducation, voted to ban the teaching of critical race theory in the state's public schools, even though critical race theory is not being taught in schools. And most of these idiots probably can't even tell you what critical race theory is. Now, critical race theory is a decades old academic framework that holds that racism is systemic because racism is systemic by nature. A lot of people are walking around confused. A lot of people walking around with degrees, okay, but don't know what racism is. Racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race. Racism comes out of the ideology of European white supremacy. Racism has nothing to do with not liking people or calling people racial epithets or things like that. Racism occurs when one race of people control the majority of the wealth, power, resources, benefits, privileges, land, access to education, access to opportunity, media, law, et cetera, healthcare, and they use this to marginalize, subordinate, and do harm to another race of people. This comes out of the ideology of European white supremacy for the purpose of preserving genetic white survival. This is what racism is. You have to understand history to really understand what racism is. And we see it throughout institutions in this country. We see it throughout the laws and policies. Okay. We, you, 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 you can look at the mistreatment of African-American farmers. You can look at uh, you can go back to 2020. Look at the fact that uh, out of 26 billion dollars, 99 percent of that went to white farmers. One percent, 20.8 million went to African-American farmers. We can look at the usage of the U.S. Interstate Highway Acts to run through African-American communities. And wipe, and, and wipe out African-American communities and wipe out homes. We can look at homes being taken by eminent domain, land being taken by eminent domain. We can look at uh, one of the tools that has been historically used to take African-Americans land is over, ta is over assessing the tax liabilities. OK, so there was a um, I was going through. Clean up uh, right here. Here it is. Uh, Washington Post, June 2nd, 2020. Black families pay significantly higher property taxes than white families. Black families pay significantly significantly higher property taxes than white families. We can look at the fact that African American homes are undervalued. Uh, the, the study coming from the Brookings Institute, $156 billion less value than comparable white homes. Okay. We can look at overtaxation on homes. We, we, we can look at how a lot of our land was stolen 
by over assessing the tax liability on land. This is systemic. Racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race, which comes out of the ideology of European white supremacy. So you got a lot of people walking around with degrees confused about what racism is. You can't fight what you don't understand. Muhammad Ali said, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Your hands can't hit what your ass can't see. If you don't know racism when you see it, how can you fight against it? So critical race theory is designed, and one of the architects of this was Kimberly Crenshaw, is designed to analyze this, understand how the laws and policies are being used to oppress non-white people, especially African-Americans. This is why Republicans are so against it, because they're the one engineering a lot of these laws and policies. They don't want, it's the magician who doesn't want you to know how he does the trick. Critical race theory is a decades old academic framework that holds that racism is systemic, embedded in government policies and laws that are evident in any serious examination of American history. Critics say racism is the work of individual bad actors. These are people that don't understand racism. Racism is a group to group relationship. Racism is a team sport. Critics say that racism is the work of individual bad actors. And they and they say teachers are improperly injecting race in the classroom. No, the teachers are telling that telling when they start dealing with systemic racism, they're largely telling the truth. You don't want them to tell the truth because you don't the magician doesn't want to tell you how he does the tricks. Now, teachers say it is impossible not to discuss race in any honest discussion or lesson about American history. Of course, all you have to do is go to the Declaration of Independence and see the hypocrisy there. We talked about this on yesterday's show. OK, uh, Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Let me turn back over to it here. We hold these truths to be self-evident. And they talk about life, liberty, and uh, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable, unalienable rights, that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, the, 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 the framers, uh, the, the, the signers of the Declaration of Independence, many of them were depriving African people of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness and, and thought that African people were inferior. Many, many of them were contradicting this, like Thomas Jefferson. Many of them were contradicting this. And then signers of the uh, uh, U.S. Constitution. All, all of them were not slave owners, but many of them were. And then the U.S. Constitution sanctioned slavery. So teachers say it is impossible not to discuss race in any honest discussion or lesson about American history. Um. So Washington Post colleagues, uh, Laura Meckler and Hannah Natteson reported uh, the educators who are teaching about racism are not actually pushing critical race theory into the classroom. No, they're not. What they are doing, they say, is addressing systemic barriers that have harmed students of color. What conservatives are doing is they're just throwing everything that they don't like about talk about race and systemic racism, they're just throwing all that into a bag and putting a label on it, call it calling it critical race theory. Most of them can't tell you what critical race theory is. Now, in the in the great state of Iowa, where Governor Kim Reynolds uh, this week uh, signed legislation banning the teaching of, quote, specific defined concepts, end quote, specific defined concepts, including critical race theory, teachers say the law is, is already uh, having a chilling effect. Sixth grade teacher Monique Cotman, C-O-T-T-M-A-N, said in an interview with Jesse Hagopian, a Seattle high school teacher and co-founder of Black Lives Matter at school, Monique Cotman said, I will say it, I, I will say it's already playing out. The white teachers, quote, she said, the white teachers who started doing a little bit more teaching about race and racism are now going back to their old way of teaching. I've had conversations with the teachers who said things like, I'm getting, I'm getting so much pushback for teaching Alice Walker. I'm going to go back to teaching what I used to teach. What'd you used to teach? Helen Keller? I mean, what'd you, what'd you, what'd you used to teach? So 
all the teachers who would have done a little bit of what I was doing, anti-racism work and culturally responsive teaching, they're not going to do anything next year. They're already declaring, quote, I'm not doing, I'm not doing nothing or it's not safe or I don't want to lose my job. So what this does is this keeps people ignorant of history. And when people are ignorant of history, they can be manipulated by people in elected positions. Because even though a lot of them in elected positions are dumb as hell, but they're a little bit smarter than the average bear. So they can manipulate them. At dozens of sites across the country on Saturday, June 12th, educators and others gathered to push back. In Memphis, Tennessee, protesters met at a site where Nathan Bedford Forrest, a Confederate general and Ku Klux Klan Grand Wizard, ran a market of enslaved African people from 1854 to 1860. Now, see, the other trick that a lot of these people are pushing, a lot of these Republicans, a lot of these conservatives are pushing, the other trick is if you start talking about systemic racism, then they'll say that you're promoting racism for talking about systemic racism. When you start explaining systemic racism, talking about how it works, talking about the laws, when you start talking about systemic racism, they'll call talking about systemic racism, racism, to shut down the conversation because they don't want to have the conversation because now you're giving away the magician's tricks. And magician can't keep pulling the wool over your eyes if you understand the prestidigitation, if you understand the sleight of hand. They can't keep manipulating you. So they want to shut down any conversation about racism, racism, the systemic racism, all that stuff, by calling you talking about it racism. So in Memphis, Tennessee, in Memphis, by the way, we talked about this in my online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. If you haven't registered for that 10-week online course, we'll post a link here. Be sure to do that. Meets on Saturdays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This past Saturday, our guest speaker was Dr. David M. Hotep, author of the book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence. But Memphis, Tennessee was named after Memphis in Egypt. And one of the founders of Memphis, Tennessee was a white supremacist named Andrew Jackson, who would later become president of the United States. He was one of the founders of Memphis, Tennessee. And, and, and uh, Memphis is named after Memphis in Egypt. Or Kemet. So in Memphis, Tennessee, protesters met at the site where Nathan Bedford Forrest, a Confederate general and Ku Klux Klan Grand Wizard, ran a market of enslaved African people from 1854 to 1860. Then they walked to the marker for the 1866 Memphis massacre at Army Park and the National Museum of Civil Rights. The event was organized by educators who teach on the downtown lot where, Na where Nathan Bedford Forrest enslaved African people, where his enslaved African people market was located. This is where these educators teach. This event was organized by educators who teach on the downtown lot where Nathan Bedford Forrest a grand words of the Ku Klux Klan where his uh, market was where he uh, sold enslaved African people. Now, the organizers of uh, Saturday's Memphis event issued a call for action with the following explanation about why the state's new law passed last month in May 2021 by the state legislature is so problematic. They said on 24th, Tennessee approved a law that intimidates teachers into lying to students about the role racism, sexism, oppression, oppression throughout U.S. history and oppression throughout U.S. history. On May 24th, Tennessee approved a law that intimidates teachers into lying to students about the role of racism, sexism, and oppression throughout U.S. history. 
as a part of a national day of action against similar laws being proposed in states nationwide. We'll walk downtown Memphis to highlight historical markers that describe events in Memphis history that, te that teachers would be forced to lie or omit facts about to ensure compliance with the new law. We'll walk downtown Memphis to highlight historical markers that describe events in Memphis history that teachers would be forced to lie or, or, or omit facts about to ensure compliance with the new law. Overall, the law brings the state government into our classrooms to restrict the ways teachers can discuss race, sexism, and oppression in American history. The law uses vague language to ban teachers from talking about social privilege, to talk, talking about racial, social privilege, and responsibility for the effects of historical oppression in class. It bans teachers from including material that makes an individual feel, quote unquote, discomfort when learning about race or gender in U.S. history. Unfortunately, a lot of American history is uncomfortable. But if it really happened, we should never lie to students in order to preserve comfort over truth. If it really happened, we should never lie to students in order to preserve comfort over truth. And the fact of the matter is, many of these white conservatives want African Americans to suffer in silence and don't want to deal with the real history. The law's vague, undefined language makes it even more of a problem. For example, it includes language that bans teachers from any lesson that could promote, quote, division between, end quote, racial groups, genders, social class, or other affiliations. Imagine having to teach about the massacres, like the Tulsa Race Massacre of uh, 1921 or the Vicksburg uh, Massacre, 1873, uh, or Colfax Massacre, Vicksburg. Uh, uh, Vicksburg, I think, was 1876. Uh, Wilmington uh, Massacre, 1898, okay? East St. Louis, um, 1908. Chicago race riot, 1919. Detroit race riot, 1943. There was one in 67. There was one in 43 during World War II up and down Woodward Avenue. Okay, that was a Detroit race riot in 1943. Imagine having to teach about massacres, about lynchings, like the 4,743 lynchings that took place in the U.S. from 1882 to 1968. And teaching about systemic oppression of African Americans that all went unpunished by the U.S. justice system. But instead of prioritizing historical fact and legacy, teachers must prioritize appeasing state regulations that ban divisive history, whatever the means. Because a lot of them just want African Americans to suffer in silence. So, for the sake of time, this is what we're going to do. Go read this full article here from the Washington Post. Uh, teachers across the country protest laws restricting lessons on racism. Okay, and this is at a, this was here at a teachers. Uh, this was here at a meeting. Ben Frazier, founder of the Northside Coalition of Jacksonville, chants, "Allow teachers to teach the truth." This African American man, he was chanting, "Allow teachers to teach the truth." This was at a meeting yeah, in Jacksonville, Florida, June tenth when they were debating passing this idiotic uh, ban on teaching critical race theory and critical race theory is not being taught in schools and there's no effort to teach it in schools. And Florida is not taught in schools, period. K through 12, they don't teach critical race theory. Uh, I wanna go to this clip here. This is from uh, Vox.com. We wanna revisit this. We've talked about this before. This is dealing with how Southern socialites like the United Daughters of the Confederacy rewrote, rewrote Civil War history. Let's go to this clip, Shakita. Well, we'll go through a couple minutes of it, a minute or so. The master often had a barbecue or a picnic for his slaves. Then they had a great frolic. Even while working in the cotton fields, they sang songs. The beat of the music and the richness of their voices made work seem light. 
Yikes. That's from History of Georgia, a textbook published in 1954 that was taught across junior high schools in Georgia for decades. That sort of language is part of an intellectual movement called the Lost Cause, a distorted version of American Civil War history that's been prevalent in the South for a long time. It took shape soon after the defeat of the Confederate States in the war, when Southern historians like Edward Pollard and former Confederate General Jubal Early started preserving the South's perspective through their writings. They framed the Confederate cause as a heroic defense of the Southern way of life against the overwhelming forces in the North. That narrative has a few basic tenets. The glorification of Confederate soldiers who died for a cause they believed in, the belief that slavery was a benevolent institution, and maybe most importantly, that slavery was not the root cause of the war. The Lost Cause is one of the most notoriously effective efforts to rewrite history, and it was done by the losing side. So how did it become so deeply rooted in Southern memory? Blame the United Daughters of the Confederacy. The UDC was founded in Nashville in 1894 to preserve Confederate culture for generations to come. The women who made up the group descended from elite antebellum families, and they used their social and political clout to spread the pro-Southern version of the war as real history. You've probably seen their efforts to honor the Confederacy, but maybe you didn't know it was the UDC. They're the ones who covered the Southern landscape with memorials for Confederate leaders and soldiers. They used their fundraising and lobbying skills to pressure local governments into erecting monuments in prominent public spaces like courthouses and state capitals. Installed here next to the state All right, capitol. Pa pause it right there, Shakita. Pause it right there for me, please. All right. Uh, those watching on Facebook and YouTube, uh, Facebook fan page, the African History Network, a YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotel. Keep watching. We're going to keep broadcasting for a few more minutes. Be sure to register for the online course that I teach ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Mahafa. Understand the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Scroll down the page to see the information for the online course. Uh, it's a 10-week online course that I teach, uh, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, uh, this past Saturday, our guest speaker was Dr. David M. Hotep, author of the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. So click on register here. Takes you to the next page. Click, click on enroll. The uh, class is half off right now. It's uh, on sale, $60. We do the class live, all the sessions. Are recorded. You can go back and watch it over and over again. I'm doing a visual presentation. We have book references, articles, uh, video clips, etc. So we'll post the link here. As soon as you register, you can start watching the content. Okay. Uh, remember, right now is correct. Wrong behavior is not over till we win. We're kind of forever, and we'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. All right, stand by. Let's continue. How's everybody doing? Uh, I'm going to continue with this clip here, and then we're going to talk uh, a little bit about. Uh, Mega Evers, and then a uh, uh, little bit about Juneteenth, and I have to get out of here because I have a lot of work to do before I leave for Atlanta. Uh, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, uh, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, or at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Okay. And our cash app uh, tag is dollar sign, the AHN show, S-H-O-W. And it shows my name there, Michael, and it shows my picture there also. All right. And this helps us keep broadcasting, keep doing the research, et cetera. This will help me get uh, to and uh, from Atlanta as well. All right. Uh, I want to continue with this here. So I, I was showing a couple of articles. One of them is we've talked about this article before. This is from July 2nd, 2020. This deals with, once again, systemic racism. Racism is systemic by nature. If you actually understand that racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race. Racism is systemic by nature. Okay. A lot of people just don't understand enough about history and laws and policies to understand uh, racism. Black families pay significantly higher property taxes than white families' new analysis shows. Unfair property assessments lead to widespread overtaxation of black American homes. This is from July 2nd, 2020, uh, Washington Post. Okay, so read this article. Um, and then we were talking about this one here from this other one from the Washington Post about uh, teachers across the country protests. 
All right. Now I want to, I need to cue this up here. This is from uh, Vox.com. And this is how Southern socialites rewrote Civil War history. This is what happens when bad history is taught. Uh, the, the clip from a couple of days ago that I played from All In with Chris Hayes when he interviewed Dr. Carol Anderson. I think that that was last Wednesday or Thursday. And uh, we talked about the Mississippi uh, State Constitution of 1890, the Mississippi State Constitution of 1890. And she mentioned um, bad, she, she mentioned uh, bad policies uh, are being written, bad laws, bad policies are being written based upon bad uh, history and, and a poor understanding of history. Okay. This is, this is the results of this. Uh, and all we have to do is go back in history and we look at the the method that was used to uh to teach the lost cause, to teach the lost cause and the harm uh, that is done. This revisionist history uh, about the Civil War. Okay, so this is one of the reasons why uh, teaching history about racism and um system, uh, you know, racism and and uh, uh, oppression and things like this, why it's extremely important for this to be taught in school. All right, uh, I want to go back to this clip here. And former Confederate General Jubal Early started preserving the South's perspective through their writings. They framed the Confederate cause as a heroic defense of the Southern way of life against the overwhelming forces in the North. That narrative has a few basic tenets. The glorification of Confederate soldiers who died for a cause they believed in. The belief that slavery was a benevolent institution. And maybe most importantly, that slavery was not the root cause of the war. The Lost Cause is one of the most notoriously effective efforts to rewrite history, and it was done by the losing side. So how did it become so deeply rooted in Southern memory? Blame the United Daughters of the Confederacy. The UDC was founded in Nashville in 1894 to preserve Confederate culture for generations to come. The women who made up the group descended from elite antebellum families, and they used their social and political clout to spread the pro-Southern version of the war as real history. You've probably seen their efforts to honor the Confederacy, but maybe you didn't know it was the UDC. They're the ones who covered the Southern landscape with memorials for Confederate leaders and soldiers. They used their fundraising and lobbying skills to pressure local governments into erecting monuments in prominent public spaces like courthouses and state capitals. Installed here next to the state capitol by the United Daughters of the Confederacy. The United Daughters of the Confederacy donated this memorial to the city back in the 30s. They put them along roadsides and in parks. Any place that was remotely relevant to the Confederacy was memorialized. By the early 20th century, the UDC had 100,000 members and chapters spread all over the country, but mostly in former Confederate states. And there's a reason they grew so quickly during that time. So we're talking about roughly three decades after the end of the war, and the Confederate veterans themselves are beginning to die off. So there is this push to find ways to commemorate it, because the big challenge by 1900 was there's a new generation of white Southerners being born, and they never experienced the, the war years. That push is visible. Most of the Confederate monuments were erected during the UDC's height of influence. There's a rhetoric around monuments that we want to get the, this thing built before all of that generation has died off. And the reason we want it is to teach future generations about those men. Dr. Karen Cox wrote the book on the UDC, and I asked her if it was fair to say the group established the lost cause as historical fact in the South. Oh my God, yeah. They were the leaders of the lost cause into the 20th century, and they made it a movement about vindication. Just to give you an idea of how effective they were, they successfully lobbied for a Confederate memorial in Arlington National Cemetery, which U.S. President Woodrow Wilson proudly unveiled to a cheering crowd. And that's influence, right? Monuments are the least of what they did. Uh, what? I mean, they, they are the most visible and tangible, but the work with children was far more influential. It turns out a central UDC objective is shaping how children think about the war and their Southern heritage. One of their most powerful tools, textbooks. Take a look at this pamphlet called A Measuring Rod for Textbooks. It was written by the illustrious Southern historian, Miss Mildred Rutherford, an educator, orator, and author of Southern history textbooks. She's also very pro-slavery. The pamphlet announced the formation of a textbook 
Public Review Committee, featuring prominent Southerners like five former Confederate generals. This group is committed to spreading the truths of Confederate history, so they instructed school boards to reject any textbooks that did not accord full justice to the South. And they urged libraries to deface every book in their collection that didn't measure up by writing the words unjust to the South clearly on its cover. This pamphlet was shared widely with school boards throughout the South, and UDC-backed committees closely monitored history books to make sure Northern influence never reached classrooms. So the core language of an approved textbook aligned precisely with that of the lost cause. You know, stuff like the Confederacy lost in the war between the states, but Georgia never forgot to honor her Confederate soldiers. The history of Georgia was on the UDC's approved list. It was also written by E. Martin Coulter, a self-described Southern historian and historian described white supremacist. They understand that how you educate, who wins the writing game, who wins the, the battle over history, ultimately wins the war. That's the big fight for the UDC. But their work with children went further than the classrooms. The UDC formed an auxiliary group called the Children of the Confederacy, which was designed to get kids born in former Confederate states to actively participate in their version of history. Group leaders had kids recite call and response truths from something called the Confederate Catechism. Children up to the age of 18 would compete and be rewarded for memorizing long passages of lost cause rhetoric. So it would be like an after school thing, you know, like that was your club. You would go after school to the meeting of the children of the Confederacy and your leader might teach you songs of the South like Dixie or other songs that were considered Southern patriotic songs. They would have them write essays, go visit the veterans and learn this catechism. Children were also the centerpiece of their community's monument unveil like this living flag at the dedication of the Stonewall Jackson Monument in Richmond. Yes, those are school children. UDC's efforts to shape the identities of children who grew up with the lost cause. They made history personal, and that made their story last. Generations and generations of children learning that narrative in a variety of ways grow up to be you know, segregationists in the 50s and 60s, because that's been drilled into them since they were children. After World War One, the UDC started losing steam. But the damage was done. The monuments were in place, and the textbooks they wrote remained in Southern classrooms until the late 70s. And the women's group did it all without the right to vote or participate in politics. You can still get glimmers of this lost cause memory of the war from people who will always choose to see it through the personal. And I think the UDC, to a great extent, was that was their goal. So the next time someone says the Confederate monuments are about remembering our history, just know that that's exactly what the United Daughters of the Confederacy all right all right so that's from um vox.com that's from vox uh how southern socialites rewrote civil war history how southern socialites rewrote civil war history is a whole concerted effort led by groups like the united daughters of the confederacy it was coordinated. It wasn't by accident. The United Daughters, Daughters of the Confederacy was a significant leader of the lost cause, an intellectual movement that revised history to look more favorably on the South after the American Civil War. They were women from elite antebellum families that used their social and political clout to fundraise and pressure local governments to erect monuments that memorialize Confederate heroes, also known as traitors. They violated Article 3, Section 3 of the U.S. Constitution. These were traitors who took up arms against the Union. They also formed textbook review committees that monitored what Southern school children learned about the war. They also formed textbook review committees that monitored what Southern school children learned about the war. Their influential work with children created a lasting memory of the Confederate cause, and those generations grew up to be the segregationists of the Jim Crow era in the South. This is, this is programming. But see, so if you understand history, you can see how they're lying and you can see this coming. OK. Um, and. You know. 
we have to understand history to one, understand how we got to this point, and two, to understand the methodology that was used in the past to run this game on us. Read this article here from uh, Mother Jones. This is another article I saw dealing with the National Day of Action. Teachers across the country are protesting laws that stop them from talking about systemic racism. Teachers across the country are protesting laws that stop them from teaching about systemic racism. We, the undersigned educators, refuse to lie to young people about U.S. history and current events, regardless of the law. This is from, um, I think this is uh, June 13th, 2021. Now, speaking of textbooks, this reminds me of a story that we just talked about a couple of weeks ago, dealing with Texas. New York Times had an article, and we talked about it here on this show, because that's what we do. We don't have time for gossiping, all this superfluous nonsense floating around. Texas pushes to obscure the state's history of slavery and racism. Texas pushes to obscure the state's history of slavery and racism. Texas is awash in bills aimed at fending off critical examinations of the state's past, of the state's past. One state bill seeks to block the Alamo complex in San Antonio from explaining that major figures in the Texas Revolution were slave traders. And Texas, and Texas is admitted into the Union in 1845 as a slaveholding state. Okay? Uh, so check out this, check out this article here. And one of the things it talks about is uh, the proposal in Texas. Uh, well, back up. it says uh, a flurry of proposed measures that could soon become law would promote even greater loyalty to Texas in the state's classrooms and public spaces as Republican lawmakers try to reframe Texas history, to try to reframe Texas history lessons and play down references to slavery and anti-Mexican discrimination that are part of the state's founding. Well, Texas was Mexican territory. Texas belonged to Mexico. Texas wins its independence from Mexico in 1836 and becomes a state in, in the Union, becomes part of the United States in 1845, and is brought into the Union as a slaveholding state. There are proposals in Texas, a state that influences school curriculums around the country through its huge textbook market amount to some of the most aggressive efforts to control the teaching of American history. And they come as nearly a dozen other Republican-led states seek to ban or limit how the role of slavery and pervasive effects of racism can be taught. Well, what did they just say here about the United Daughters of the Confederacy? It said their influential work with children, their influential, it said they also formed textbooks review committees. They went after the textbooks because they know, understand that's programming. They formed textbooks review committees that monitored what Southern school children, children learned about the Civil War. Their influential work with children created a lasting memory of the Confederate cause and those generations grew up to be the segregationists of the Jim Crow era in the South. All right, now. Let's see here, okay. So read that one from New York Times, we talked about that a couple weeks ago. Texas pushes to obscure the state's history of slavery and racism. Um, 
Okay, very quickly, we, we'll talk a little bit about Mega Evers. We'll talk some more about Mega Evers tomorrow, and then we'll squeeze in a little bit, a little information about uh, Juneteenth, and then I've got to get out of here. So, uh, history.com is a good piece on Mega Evers. You know, he was assassinated June 12, uh, 1963. Okay. We talked about Mega Evers on yesterday's show. He's oftentimes left out of uh, history when talking about the uh, civil rights movement. He was uh, only uh, 37 years old when he was assassinated. So history.com has a good... Uh, piece here dealing with um seven things you should know about mega evers seven things you should know about mega evers okay we'll cover uh a couple of them today we'll probably talk some more about this on tomorrow's show and uh let me see if we can pull this up here All right. Seven things you should know about Mega Evers. So Mega Evers was a World War II veteran, as we uh, talked about on yesterday's show. He served in, uh, uh, he fought in World War II. He was there in Normandy for D-Day, okay, uh, June 6, 1944. There were 2,000 African-American soldiers approximately uh, that landed in France on D-Day. Mega Evers was one of them. He was born in Decatur, Mississippi, on July second, nineteen uh, on July second, nineteen twenty five. Okay, born in Decatur, Mississippi. Hold on, just a second. What happened here? All right. Born in Decatur, Mississippi, uh, July 2nd, 1925. He was the third of five children born to a farmer and sawmill worker, uh, James Evers, and his wife, Jessie. Now, Mega Evers left high school at the age of 17 to enlist in the still segregated U.S. Army, eventually rising to the rank of sergeant. In June, June of 1944, Mega Evers' unit was part of the massive post D Day invasion of Europe, and he served uh, in both France and Germany until his honorable discharge in 1946. Due to his wartime service, Mega Evers was buried in Arlington National Cemetery with full military honors following his death in 1963. Now, Mega Evers was the NAACP's first field secretary in the South, the NAACP's first field secretary in the South. Uh, returning to Mississippi after the war, after World War II, Mega Evers attended Alcorn College, now Alcorn State University on the GI Bill, earning honors as one of the most successful students in the nation. After moving to nearby Mound Bayou, and Mound Bayou was founded by Isaiah T. Montgomery, who was a trader, who was the only African-American in the, uh, the state delegation there during the um, Mississippi uh, State Convention of 1890, where they voted on the Mississippi State Convention, uh, Mississippi State Constitution. And the Mississippi State Constitution instituted poll taxes and literacy tests, and, and he voted uh, in favor of it. This, Isaiah T. Montgomery. I think he's related to uh, Senator Tim Scott. Uh, I think. I'm not 100% certain, but it's possible. Read um, this piece here from history.com. We've talked about it before. 
how Jim Crow era laws suppress the African American vote for generations. How Jim Crow era laws suppress the African American vote for generations. May 13th, 2020, from history.com. One of the first things they talk about is the 1890 Mississippi State Constitution. Now, you know, we dealt with this uh, last either last Wednesday or Thursday here on the show. And we talked about how, how at the convention, they said, uh, uh, Judge uh, uh, Saladin said, we are here to exclude the Negro. He said, we are here to exclude the Negro. We came here to exclude the Negro. Nothing short of this will, uh, will answer. Uh, uh, County Judge Solomon Saladin Calhoun. Now, at the 1890 Mississippi State Convention, a new constitution was adopted that included a literacy test and poll tax for eligible voters. Under the new literacy requirement, a potential voter had to be able to read any section of the Mississippi state constitution or understand any section when read to him or give a reasonable interpretation of any section. Okay, read the rest of this here. How Jim Crow era law suppressed the African American vote for generations. All right, let's continue. So um, back to Mega Evers. Now, uh, Mega Evers uh, worked as an insurance agent in mound we talked about mound mound bayou isaiah t montgomery was the founder of mound bayou uh mississippi and mayor of mound bayou as well now mega evers worked as an insurance agent and began attending meetings of a local civil rights organization the regional council of negro leadership the rc rcnl the regional council of negro leadership in 1954, the same year as the landmark Supreme Court decision, Brown versus Board of Education, struck down racial segregation in public schools, Megger Evers became one of the first African Americans to apply for admission to the, to the University of Mississippi Law School, University of Mississippi Law School. When Megger Evers' application was denied on a technicality, the school claimed that he had failed to include the required letters of recommendations, the written letters of recommendations. Megger Evers approached the National Association, the NAACP for help. NAACP Mississippi State Conference leader E.J. Stringer was so taken with Megger Evers' poise and determination that he instead offered Megger Evers a position as the organiza organization's first field secretary in the state of Mississippi. Megger Evers accepted the position and by December 1954 he had opened an office in Jackson Mississippi where within three years Mega Evers had nearly doubled NAACP membership in Mississippi to more than 15,000 members one of Mega Evers first assignments was investigating the murder of Emmett Till in August of 1955 August 28, 1955, exactly. The Chicago-born Emmett Till, who was just 14 years old and visiting relatives in Money, Mississippi, was kidnapped, tortured, and killed by two white supremacists after reportedly flirting with the wife of a local shopkeeper. Three days later, Emmett Till's beaten and disfigured body was found in a nearby river. He had been shot in the head and, and weighed down with a metal fan in an attempt to hide his bot body. In Chicago, his mother, Mamie Till Bradley's insistence on a well-publicized open casket funeral for her son brought the plight of African-Americans in the South to newspapers across the country. In Mississippi, the NAACP, fearful that the highly segregated sheriff's office would not mount much of an effort to catch Emmett Till's white murderers, the NAACP launched their own investigation. Megger Evers and two other field workers, Ruby Hurley 
and and AMZ Moore, A M Z I E, AMZ Moore, track down potential witnesses to the events leading up to and including Emmett Till's abduction. They track down potential witnesses to the events leading up to and including Emmett Till's abduction. They convinced several people to come forward, keeping them in protective custody when they testified at the 1955 trial of the two white men accused of killing Emmett Till and then shepherding them out of town in, secrets, in secrecy when the all-white jury returned a verdict of not guilty after deliberating for just an hour. And everybody knew that those two men were guilty. Okay, Roy Bryant and J.W. Millam. Everybody knew they were guilty. Not only did they know they were guilty, but just a few months later, they did an interview for Look Magazine and they confessed They confessed to killing Emmett Till in the interview with Look Magazine. But because they were acquitted of murder, okay, they could not be tried again under double jeopardy laws. They, they admitted to killing Emmett Till in the uh, uh, article in Look Magazine, and they were paid for that article. They were paid for that interview for that article as well. All right, so we'll talk some more about this on tomorrow's show. Uh, probably, hopefully. Uh, seven things you should know about Megar Evers. Okay, this is from history.com. All right, lastly, we'll talk a little bit about Juneteenth here, and we'll talk some more tomorrow. Um, so I'm working on um, my Juneteenth presentation, and I'll be recording that. So I'll be doing a new t Juneteenth 2021 presentation. Look out for that. We'll have it on digital download and DVD, so I'll announce it when it's ready. You can uh, order it from our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. All right, so a lot of people have learned more about Juneteenth the past two or three years, okay? Um, so on, on June 19th, 1865, two months after the surrender of Confederate General Robert E. Lee at, at the Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia, uh, you, uh, uh, Union... Uh, Major General Gordon Granger and approximately 1,800 federal troops arrived in Galveston, Texas to take control of the state and enforce the Emancipation Proclamation. Emancipation Proclamation from January 1st, 1863. That's not what legally frees the slaves, but they're there to enforce it because the uh, Civil War is over with. Okay, so they're there to enforce it, and you're going to need a 13th Amendment ratified December of 1865 uh, that is legally going to uh, free free the, the, the enslaved Africans. So General Gordon Granger delivered order number, general order number three, which declared in part, quote, the people of Texas are informed that in accordance with a proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. Now, Juneteenth, which is a contraction of June and 19th, is a holiday commemorating this day, which marked the effective, you know, people say the effective end of slavery in the United States. Okay, now, you see, that's tricky when you say that. The reason why is because you're going to have, so for, for you could say for the majority of them in Texas, Texas was involved in the Civil War to a lesser extent. And this, these are, um, they're going throughout Texas delivering General Order Number Three to different groups of enslaved Africans. On June 19th, they deliver it to, to these Africans in Galveston, Texas. Now, you're going to have some slave owners that keep this message from their slaves until the following season is not exactly we don't know 100 percent why one theory is 
they did this to to get another season of work and working in the fields out of them okay but the other thing is you're going to have um uh, native american nations that own slaves the choctaw chickasaw creek cherokee and seminole indians and after the civil war ends they don't let their slaves go right away Th this is this, this is why you needed the, this is part of the reason why you needed the black freedmen indian treaties of 1866 because it stipulated that they had to turn their slaves loose because some of those nations were saying we're sovereign states we don't, we don't have to abide by those laws so some of them held their slaves until like 1866-1867. In reality, the Emancipation Proclamation did not instantly free the slaves, as I've said numerous times before, because it only applied to places under Confederate control and not to slave-holding border states or rebel areas already under union control. And all you have to do is go to loc.gov Library of Congress website and read the Emancipation Proclamation. It gives all it gives you all these exceptions. It says basically says uh slaves in states that are in rebellion are free, but slaves in border states like Maryland, Delaware, Delaware, Missouri, Kentucky, they're still slaves. The slaves in border states are still slaves, and then and then the, the 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 slaves in areas that were in rebellion but came back under control of the Union, they were still slaves also. So when you read the Emancipation Proclamation, no, that's not what freed them, because you you read about all these exceptions in there. That's why it's important to read. However, as Northern troops advanced into the Confederate South. Many slaves fled behind Union lines. So this is what Juneteenth commemorates when these Africans and enslaved Africans in Galveston, Texas, got the news. In amazement and disbelief, the 250,000 former slaves in Texas learned that they had been freed by the Emancipation Proclamation, which could not be enforced until the war was over. It applied only to the states in rebellion at the time it was issued. Okay, so we'll talk more about Juneteenth in the next coming, coming days. If you like some type of information, also you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, okay? Uh, and then be sure to register for the online course that I teach, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. This is a, this is a 10 week online course that I teach. We deal with thousands of years of history and we deal with what led up to uh, the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Our guest speaker uh, on Saturday, June 12th, was. Dr. David M. Hotep, author of the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. We had a fantastic class with him. Uh, he gave us so much information. He talked about the premise of his book, talked about the arche archaeological evidence supporting that. He talked about uh, new archaeological discoveries that uh, show an African presence in Central America, uh, in Mexico, dating back uh, at least 250,000 years ago. And that's peer-reviewed evidence. So he talked about that also. We had, I mean, we, we did about two hours with him. So we'll post a link here. You can register for the full 10-week online course. We do the classes live. All of them uh, are recorded. You can go back and watch it over and over again. Okay. And his new book, uh, the, this is his first book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. He talked about his new book, The First Americans Were Africans Revisited. All right, I think I have the cover of his new book. Do I have it here? I downloaded it. Let's see here. Uh, his new book, he said, will be out in two to three weeks. Well, this is him uh, when he spoke to uh, my class in February, and he's holding up the, uh, the new book. This is all exclusive. This is all exclusive content here. He spoke to my online course uh that that book would be out in two to three weeks the first americans were africans 
expanded and revised. That's Dr. David M. Hotep there. Uh, so look out for that as well. We're going to bring them back on for an interview when that book comes out. It'll be available on Amazon. All right, and I'll see you all at the uh, Juneteenth Festival as well in uh, Atlanta. So visit JuneteenthATL.com uh, for more information. JuneteenthATL.com also. Uh, Friday, June 18th through Sunday, June 20th. And I'll be there all three days. I'll have a vendor booth um, all three days. I'll be speaking there Saturday and Sunday uh, in the amphitheater. Saturday and Sunday should be 3 p.m. both days, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m., something like that. We'll post updates on, on our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Now, the parade is on Saturday at 12 noon on Auburn Avenue. That's where the parade starts, okay? So they have thousands of people that come through over the course of three days. They have usually about 100 to 130 vendors. This is at Centennial Olympic Park, Centennial Olympic Park. And uh, also uh, Arrested Development is uh, performing this year um, as well. They're, they are a headliner act uh, this year, Arrested Development. Some of you have seen the uh, my postings of this on social media. A speech there in the middle. I got to see if I can interview speech again. But uh, they'll be performing also. All right. Okay, look, hey, we have to get out of here. Remember the, uh, oh, uh, all my DVD lectures and digital downloads are at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. So you can get, uh, you can uh, order them there. And all this helps support the African History Network, helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting. Um, those in Atlanta, I will uh, see you all soon. And uh, we'll be back uh, tomorrow. Remember, right now is correct for wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. Wakanda forever. Thanks for watching. Peace.